So I want to begin today, I want to begin today by speaking a single word. I'm going to speak a single word, and when I speak that single word, I want you to immediately decide in your own mind, is this hitting me, and, and is it eliciting in me a positive or a negative response? So I'm going to speak one word, and then you immediately decide that, and then I'm going to kind of ask you to let me know what you're thinking. So here it goes. Here's our word. Are you ready? Perfection. Okay? Perfection. All right. Will you be willing to kind of let us see in public here? Let's see. How many said, when you heard the word perfection, you went, oh, that elicited a positive response to me? Good. Good. Okay. I mean, I see the hands of those that elicited a negative response in. Uh, I think the, uh, the nose have it, looks like. Any mixed feelings? Yeah, 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 me too. A few mixed feelings. July 20. July 20, 1976. I mean, I see the hands of those who were living at that time. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, this is about, okay, for those of you who are living, we're not going to ask those who weren't, but those who were, do you remember what happened on that day? July 20, 1976. First of all, I'm going to say this. 1976 was an amazing year. In January of that year, a boy named George and a girl named Leanne met each other. Okay? So that was kind of a big deal, and the rest is history, and seven grandkids later. Okay? So there it is. But that was January of 19, in a place called Berrien Springs, and I've got to tell you that I've got to tell you that, that whole month of January... It never got above zero. We're talking Fahrenheit, folks, okay? So it never got above zero at Andrews University. It was one cold time. But we met then, and then you go on down a few months, and you get to the 4th of July, and the USA celebrated what? The bicentennial. It's, 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 it's celebration of, of 200 years, a birthday that was just a big time. And I remember Leanne and I, who were dating at that time, going there to watch the little fireworks at Berrien Springs. And it had rained and got rained out like two or three days in a row. And it was so soggy that only about maybe a third of the fireworks actually worked. Some just fizzed and all the rest. So I won't forget that time. Um, and then on July 20, on July 20, in the city of Montreal, Canada... A 14-year-old girl from Onest, Romania. Do you know where I'm going with this? By the way, Onest is the hometown of someone, some people we know, Irvin Gruia, Manuela Mann. Uh, but in Onest, Romania, a 14-year-old girl in Montreal named Nadia Kamenich. Okay, we getting there now? That Nadia, on that day, on that day, scored the first perfect 10 in Olympic history in gymnastics. Anybody here see it with their own eyes when it happened? Yeah, I did. Leanne and I were watching this thing. And we were watching, and we were just going, what? And it was so amazing when it happened. A perfect 10. No one had ever done it. It was on the, this compulsory, uneven bars that she was flying and doing all of, all of her exercises on. When it happened, everyone was stunned. I mean, 10 meant perfection. It had never been reached before in all of Olympic history. And when, that, when she hit that 10, that elusive ideal that everyone chases, but no one had ever reached, she reached it. The commentators were just, they were beside themselves. They were just stunned. In fact, what's interesting, and maybe you don't remember this part. I didn't remember it, so I looked it up. And that is that the electronic scoreboard got confused and didn't know what to do with it and popped up a 1.00. And when, when she finished and she turned to look at the scoreboard, 14 years old, and saw 1.00, she turned to I mean, she thought she had just blown her whole, you know, her whole Olympic opportunities. It was, it was that kind of a moment that was just unbelievable. It was a stunning achievement. In fact, I want to say it this way, a sublime moment of perfection in our imperfect world. A sublime moment of perfection in our imperfect world. Now... Let's come closer, closer to today. Um, can I see the hands of those who were live on Tuesday? Okay, good. All right, good. All right, good. On Tuesday, on Tuesday, the 10th anniversary, that would be January 15, of another event that speaks of perfection. Uh, does anybody know where I'm going with this one? That was Tuesday of this week. On Tuesday of this week, the 10th anniversary... 
January 15, 2009, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 lifted out of LaGuardia. And as it came out of LaGuardia and was making its climb out, you remember what happened? It hit a flight of Canada geese, okay? And hits this flight of Canada geese, and when it hit it, it sucked in the engine and, and shut down the engines on that plane. It was just climbing out, and do you remember who was in the cockpit? Yeah, that's right, that's right. We know his name, well, at least we know his nickname. Captain Solenberger. Anybody remember the name of the co-captain? Jeffrey Skiles. And those two men in that cockpit suddenly had a silent plane, no engines, and they were not that far off the ground. And Sullenberger, Sully, Captain Sully, looked at Teterboro Airport. He looked back at LaGuardia, and he looked and he saw the Hudson River. And he had to make a decision and make it fast. And he made the decision, you remember. And with those engines off and that plane in glide mode, it came down about 900 feet above George Washington Bridge and came down toward the Hudson. 155 souls on board. And does anybody remember that day? It was amazing. Came down and, and landed on that Hudson, and I still remember the pictures that, were, that came out. Here was a plane on the water, and all these people standing, looking like they were walking on water. That's why they called it the miracle on the Hudson. I mean, here's all these people standing out there on the wings, but looking like they're standing on water itself. And that miracle on the Hudson, all 155 people survived that landing. I looked this up yesterday, and guess what the news report said? It said, he came over the George Washington Bridge, came down to the Hudson, and made a, here's the word, picture-perfect landing. Picture-perfect. So I'm going to say that Nadia's perfect 10 and that Solly's picture-perfect landing, that's kind of like perfection at its best. In this world, that's, where, that's on the, that good side of perfection. But now I'm going to look at the other side with all the hands that went up and said, when you heard the word perfection, you went, you know. And, it, and, I, and as I thought about this, I haven't thought about this in years or years or years. But in years, years, and years, I've not thought. And then yesterday I remembered. I remembered sitting at my piano lessons. Have you ever seen me play piano here at the church? <laughs> okay. I remember sitting at my piano lessons in the afternoon after school, two yards away, I mean yard, I mean, not mean like yardstick, I mean the next door neighbor and then the next door neighbor, Jerry Rensel's house, I could hear the guys, my neighborhood buds, playing football two yards away. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, oh, and, fine, and I call out, I should say yell out, okay, I was going to be more, you know, I called to my mom. I yelled to my mom, mom, can I go out and play? And I can still hear my mom's sweet voice calling, yelling back, whatever that was. And she calls back and she says, sure, as soon as, as soon as you play each one of those pieces without a mistake, you can go out. Ah. And I'm thinking, oh no, oh no. If that's the case, I will never get, out, get done with this. I'll never get a chance to play. I'll, never, I'll be here forever. Now. I'm going to take the next step, and that is, that is the same feeling that, oh no, I'm going to be here forever. It's the same, same feeling that some of us, in fact, perhaps many of us got on day eight as we read from our 40 days, our 40 days of prayer. Does anybody know what passage I'm referencing here? Now, I'm going to go back and say, I want to go back and say what I said last Sabbath, and, and I really mean this. This book is such a blessing in, for Leanne and I in our lives. This book has led us to actually intentionally pray with, together with each other, typically right at supper time when we're both awake. But, you know, and, and actually, it, it's led us into prayer in a way, and it's and more than just led us into prayer. It has led us to specifically pray for God to pour his Holy Spirit into our lives. Today makes day 14, and I prayed it again this morning as I woke up, and I sang that song, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. And I, I sing that, and I, I wake up in the night, and I'm singing that song, and, and I pray this, and God is blessing us. So I want, everything I say, that's the first thing I want to say. 
But secondly, I want to say that as I read on day eight, and as I received some communication, that I realized that as we read these verses, in fact, I want you to see the passage here on the screen, the one that kind of jumped out first. So can we go there on the screen? Here it is, Christ's Object Lessons, page 69. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. And all God's people said, yeah, yes. Next, for, next sentence. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Did, it, did that hit anybody in a way that was like, oh. Oh, man, we're going to be here forever. Anybody hear it that way? A few, that was paragraph one on page 35 in, in the 40 Days book. You go down to paragraph five, and we read these words. Let's go to paragraph five. Today, God is calling his people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Yes. Today, when we baptize Luke... And Ryan, in second service, at the end of that baptism, I'm going to lay hands on them, and I'm going to pray that God, will bap- they've been baptized with water, I'm going to pray that they be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And by the way, that baptism of the Holy Spirit is an invitation for a daily infilling of the Holy Spirit in your life and in mine, not just once at baptism, but daily. Okay, God is calling His people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in preparation for becoming just like Jesus in order to receive the latter reign of the Spirit and to be ready for Christ's return. And all God's people said? All five of us. Okay, there we go. And we look at this and we say, okay, Lord, here's this call in the Christ Object Lessons that we would, that we would perfectly reproduce the character of Christ and that we, we, we would become just like Jesus and we receive the latter reign of the Spirit and be ready for Christ's return and share the soon coming of Jesus Christ. So what do we do with this? I mean, what, what do we do with these statements? How do we engage them? What do we say to these? Do we just kind of blow them off? And just kind of, ah, nobody's perfect. And so that's just kind of, that's kind of like... You know, Sister White with some hyperbole and, and, and Dennis Smith who wrote this book, he's just kind of over-speaking and overstepping it and so on. Is that what we do? Or do we say, oh, no, I, I know, but then there's this, oh, I can never do this and go into despair. I mean, how do we respond to this? What do we do with it? Nobody's perfect. We know that. Nobody's perfect. And then we go, yeah, but what about these words from Matthew chapter 5, verse 48? Matthew 5 and verse 48. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Who said that? Jesus. So we, we receive these words, perfectly reproduce the character of Christ. Be just like Jesus. You must be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Where do we go with this? Is there any hope for us? Is there any hope to reach such a, such a standard, such a high and lofty standard? I want to go back to the first statement. We don't have to go back on the, on the screen, but I want to go back to that statement to perfectly re- reproduce the character of Christ and ask this question. Where would you go in Scripture to see a picture of the character of Christ? Well, there's so many places. So many places, Pastor. We could go, you know, we could go to the Gospels. We go, okay, I understood. I'm going to propose that we go to Hebrews chapter 10. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to start in Hebrews chapter 10 there at verse 5. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, okay, that tells me we could actually kind of mark this on a calendar. We know that he came into this world nine months before he was born. So we're going to go, when was he born? Well, he was born back there, AC, to see, B.C., A.D., and there's probably about 4 B.C., the scholars tell us, that get the dates, somewhere in there. When he came in, in other words, the point I'm making here is, this is an incarnation statement. This is a point where, here's Christ, and he's going to come into the world, 
And as he's preparing to come into the world, he makes this statement. Just prior to being a a one-celled zygote in the womb of the Virgin Mary, waiting his birthday. When Christ came into the world, he said this, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired. You look at the whole planet, and there's, there, there are animals being sacrificed, being put in place of trying to, and in fact, in many, many places of the world, human sacrifices even. You can look at the history of the world, and it's not pretty. This whole, this whole idea of how to come to God and what God demands and what God requires, it's so interesting. Sacrifice and offering, he says, God says, I didn't desire this. This is not meeting the need. It's not solving the problem. But what does he say? You didn't desire the sacrifice and offering. You didn't desire, but a body you have prepared for me. There's going to be someone that's going to come. And remember the story of Abraham and Isaac there on the Mount Moriah. And remember, Abraham is going to take his son to sacrifice him there on that mountain. And, and he's there. He's prepared. And the Lord steps in, the angel of the Lord, and stops him and says, over there, caught in the thicket. There in the thicket, you're going to see a ram caught in there, and that is the one. And on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. I'm going to provide this. I'm going to solve this. God says, I am going to, you don't fix this. You don't fix it by what you bring. It's what I, it's not what you give me. It's what I give you. Amen? That's right at the heart of Christian theology. It's right at the heart of the, of the good news it's not what you give me, and, and, and to give me your very best gift, which would be the, the fruit of your own body that you would give of your own son. No, it's not what you give me, it's what I give you. Here comes your brother Abel with a lamb. All the way back to what? Chapter 4 of the Bible? Here comes your brother Abel with a lamb. So, sacrifice and offering, you, but a body you prepared for me. Sin offerings, you take no pleasure. Burnt offerings. Then I said... Here is where I believe we see and hear the character of of the Lord himself. Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as is written of me in the scroll of the book. It's interesting. That's from Psalm 40. You go back there, the original, and actually the text actually says, Behold, I delight to do your will. Behold, I come to do your will. I delight to do this. This is what I want to do. This is what I desire to do. And when I look at this, I go, this is who Jesus is. He's saying, I want to do your will, God. I've I've come to do your will. And you think about this. This baby conceived and then born on his birthday. And this baby, this little one who grows up saying, I've come to do God's will. By the way, do you know any other babies like that on the planet? Huh? Anybody know another baby who goes, oh, I've come to do your will. I, I really want... No, I don't. Was I... Want... No, 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 it's not your will, it's my will, okay? Not your will, but mine be done, okay? That's where, that's where we come from. We sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. We sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. We come from that place. That's where we, not your will, but my will be done. That's where we are. But watch what we see in Jesus. What we see in Jesus is this one who at the very beginning says, behold, I've come to do your will. When the disciples ask him, they say, "Uh, would you please teach us how to pray? And he says, okay, here it is. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, what? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We hear it in his, in his maturity, 30 some years, 30 years old, and here he is, and what he said at the beginning, I've come to do your will, he is now saying, and even teaches his disciples to pray it, I pray God that your will would be done. And then you come all the way to the end of his life, to the Garden of Gethsemane, and there at Gethsemane, what do we hear him say? As he nails on that, he goes, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, what? Not my will, but thy will be done. I mean, you talk about bookending a life. From from the very beginning, I've come to do your will, all the way to the end, where he says, not my will, but yours be done, and in between, your will be done on earth. This is what we see in terms of the character, this character of Christ that would be perfectly reproduced in his people. We're seeing a 
this willingness, this desire that God's will be done. A, a willingness that says, I am, I am willing to bow before you. I will kneel before you. I will not insist on, how does it say in Philippians 2? He did not insist on a grasp and equality with God, but made himself nothing and became a servant. He is showing us, the inv- he's giving us the invitation that we would live as servants, who would be obedient in life and be obedient even to death, all the way to death, even death on a cross in Christ's sake and in Christ's experience. So we look at that and say, okay. Now, on that same night of Gethsemane, there was somebody else. Someone else who had been invited to step into this. He'd heard it with his own ears. He had watched it for three and a half years. His name was Simon Peter. Simon Peter, three and a half years, had watched this man who always submitted to God's will. That was the the, the, the hallmark of his character, and Simon Peter, who, even when Jesus had said, you know, the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem, and he must suffer, and Peter, remember what Peter said, Lord, this will never happen to you, no way, and remember Jesus gave the strong, strongest rebuke ever, get behind me, Satan. You have in mind the things of man, not the things of God. You're thinking like a natural-born sinner, like, like all of us are. We're thinking just, how can I make this world work? And he goes, no, 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 I'm inviting you to live a life where you say, God, not my will, but yours be done. And Peter said, yes. Peter said, no. Dug in his heels. For all we know, and I think we have evidence for it, I think he dug in his heels and took a little offense. You call him, what do you mean, get behind me, Satan? What are you talking about? In front of all my friends here, you're going to call me Satan? I, all I know is, is he kept resisting. And even to the Last Supper, when Jesus said, Peter, and Peter goes, ah, oh, they might leave you. I will never leave you. I would never. And, and Jesus says to Peter, Satan has asked that he might have you to sift your soul, man. I've been praying for you, Peter. And here's Peter still. And, and you remember what happened that night. It's Peter who then in the, in the moment of extremity, and someone calls him out and goes, hey, you're one of the Galileans. You're one of his followers. And Peter's going, who? What? Who the bleep bleep is Jesus? I mean, who? He starts doing everything he can to convince people. I never even heard of the man. Never met him before. I mean, here he is. This is Peter. Peter who's showing in his character the exact opposite of the character of Christ. Not one who was willing to say, Lord, your will be done. But one is going, no, my will. We're going to win this thing. We're going to beat those Romans. I got my weapon with me tonight. I'm, 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 I'm packing. No, no, here's Peter. Look at these words from guess what book? I want you to get this. And I want to thank you, Robert, for sharing this with me. Robert Stafford, who brought this. This book is Christ's Object Lessons, written by, oh, the same author who wrote the first statement we looked at. The character of Christ perfectly reproduced. Look at these words. Uh, There it is. The nearer we come to Jesus the more clearly we discern the purity of his character, more clearly discern the exceeding sinfulness of sin, the less we feel like exalting ourselves. Those whom heaven recognizes as holy ones are the last to parade their own goodness. Here we come to Peter. The apostle Peter became a faithful minister of Christ. He was greatly honored by divine light and power. I mean, he wrote two of the books of the Bible, right? He had an active part in the upbuilding of Christ's church. But Peter never forgot the fearful experience of his humiliation. His sin was forgiven. Yet well he knew that for the weakness of character which he had caused his fall, only the grace of of Christ could avail. He found himself in himself nothing in which to glory. We are now approaching the reality of what God is intending to do in, in the lives of his people. This character of Christ perfectly reproduced in us, here it is. Look at this line. Did, did Helen White write this line? Are you kidding me? Look at this. None, not one, of the apostles or the prophets ever claimed to be without sin. Not one of them. Men who have lived nearest nearest to God. Men who would sacrifice life itself rather than knowingly commit a wrong act. Men whom God had honored with divine light and power 
have confessed the sinfulness of their own nature. They have put no confidence in the flesh. They have claimed no righteousness of their own. They have trusted wholly in the righteousness of whom? Christ, the one who always did his Father's will. See, we look at it so often, we look at it, oh, Ellen White, she, boy, she, such a perfection. She, and she, are you kidding me? We have to read this thing, and, and I know we've, we've misused, and we've re- used a sentence here or a passage here and not seen big picture stuff. Um, someone said to me several years ago when I preached a message on this and came out to the front door as they, as they were leaving and said, Are you saying she's wearing a white hat? And I said, Yes, I am. Yes, I am. From 1888 on, it's so clear when she went in and engaged that battle. If it's not for Sister White, for Ellen White, um, uh, this church never, it, 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 she dragged us into the gospel, kicking and screaming. She dragged us in. And, and kicking and screaming, and why do I say drag? Because our default position is to make it work ourselves. And that's not just for Adventists, that's the whole world, that's every church. It's, it's, it's that default position is we're going to solve this. We'll fix it. We'll make the bigger sacrifice. I'll climb to the mountain. I'll do whatever. I'll give this. I'll give, I'll give my, I'll give my firstborn all these things that humans have tried. That's the default position of the human race. And the Lord says, no, no, the good news is it's not what you give me. It's what I give you. And there it is. Trusted wholly in the righteousness of Christ. So will it be with all who behold Christ. Now catch this paragraph. Let's go to the next one. And this is the end of the statement. At every advance step. Okay, here we are. Remember the, this is the old song? We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Every round goes higher, higher. Okay, I'm getting higher. And by the way, I've been in the way longer than you have. I'll bet you I, I can be up high enough and look down on you. Is that possible that I could look down on you because I'm higher, higher? Oh, really? What does this say? At every advanced step in Christian experience, our Pride, our repentance will deepen. Huh? Yeah. What does what she say in Steps to Christ? The closer we come to Christ, the more we see of our own imperfection. The closer I get to Jesus, the more reason I have to repent. That just turns this whole understanding of perfection on its head. Amen? It, it, it flips it. And it, what it does is, is it brings me to my knees. It brings me to my knees where I am, where I kneel with the apostles and all of God's people. We kneel there like Paul at the end of his life and goes, I am chief of sinners. I recognize that need. And it's that place, bringing me to that place that then brings me into this relationship that God has not been, been trying to lead me to the whole way. Now, okay, pastor, so can you give me something, like how does this thing work out in, in life? I mean, you know, our prince will deepen, our lips will not be opened in self-glorification. We shall know that our sufficiency in Christ alone. I love that song, in Christ alone. Here it is, in Christ alone, our hope is found. That's it. He's it. He's the only place. Go back to Hebrews 10 and look at these words. Hebrews 10, verse 14. I know I'm doing it on the screen. I hope you will go this afternoon and look at it right in your Bible itself. For by one sacrifice, I wonder which one that is. Oh, maybe this one. For by one sacrifice, he has, catch the verb tense, has made perfect forever. What verb tense would that be? Past tense, continuous? For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever. Oh, good, I can just do my, you know, oh, good, I got my fire insurance, and I'll just do my cheap grace thing. No, no, no. By one sacrifice, he's made perfect forever. Those who, these, these, these two phrases need to be seen as happening at the same time. By one sacrifice, he's made perfect forever. Those who are being made holy. Those who are being sanctified, set apart for God's purpose, a call to holiness in our lives, that we would live this out. That's, the, that's this verse. Hebrews 10, 14 says it. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever with the righteousness of Christ. Those who are saying yes, and what does it mean to be made holy? It means that every time the Spirit, here's where we want to come awake. Every time the Spirit goes, hey, George, what you just did there, 
Hey, George, what you just said there? Hey, George, what you just fought there? Hello? Shine a light on it. Holy Spirit goes, there it is. The Holy Spirit who convicts of righteousness and, and judgment and sin. This Holy Spirit goes, hello. And when I see that, when the Holy Spirit brings something to me, what he's telling me is, when I bring up this issue in your life, I'm telling you, I'm telling you that I intend to break that chain in your life and to set you free from it. Oh, that's like perfectionism. No, that's not perfectionism. That's saying that God will break every chain. And if he breaks the chains that I know about right now today, and if I say yes to him, by Tuesday morning, he's going to give me 150 more. Because he's going to peel the layer, remember, peel the layer of the onion. By the way, when we peel onions, what happens? It stinks and we cry, okay? We peel onions, it stinks and we cry. And he peels the layer and he peels the layer as long as we live. He calls us as we come closer to deepen our repentance and to bring us in the very place that Jesus was where we're going, I want to do your will. I actually desire to do your will. I really do. By one sacrifice, he is made perfect forever. Those who are being made holy. Look at verse 15 and 16. Notice the Holy Spirit getting engaged here. Holy Spirit testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make after that time, says the Lord. I'm going to put my law on your heart and on your mind. I'm going to write it on your mind. What he's saying is, as you come to me and you give your life to me, he says, I am going to actually, you're going to actually know what my will is. In heart, organ of desire, you're going to want to do what you ought to do. When's the last time, when is the last time you wanted to do what you ought to do? Oh, I know, when you fell in love. When I want to do what I ought to do, it's when I'm falling in love. See, and this takes me to the character of Jesus. I've come to do your will, oh my God. It's the falling in love piece. Now with that, I want to do a quick, and we do, we have, we have like, Six minutes. Okay, so let's do it. Let's go right back to Matthew 5 on that passage about be perfect as your Father in heaven. Please see the context of this passage. Here it is. You've heard it said. You have heard, by the way, be perfect as your Father in heaven is verse 48. So watch us as we get to 48. You've heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy Pray for those who persecute you, that you'll be like, be like, may be sons of your Father who's in heaven. He makes the sun rise on the evil, on the good, sends rain on the just and on the unjust. He says, this is what I'm, look, he says, Jesus is saying, look what God does. See how God does this? You thought you're supposed to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Look at him, love both the neighbor and the enemy. Both the one who is like me and the one who is unlike me. Let's go to the next verse. What, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do that? He's saying, well, you're just going to take, you're just going to love the people that are like you? And not. So, many of you know that this last past, past week on Monday and Tuesday, you know that the pastors and the teachers of the Oregon Conference, Christina, you were there, but, um, and Nancy, you were there, but pastors and teachers were gathered together, um, and, and Principal, you were there, and Carla, you were there, but we, with this last past week, we went there and we, we heard a call to love well, and, and to love those whom especially those whom we have not loved well. And there was a special call to love those who are LGBTQ. And it was a very powerful, powerful set of meetings. It was a call to say, and the presenter, Bill Henson, stood up and he said, am I saying that we should change our position on the biblical understanding of marriage and sexual morality? He said, no. We're not calling to change our position, but we are calling to change our posture and to repent for the ways in which we have not loved like Jesus loves. And especially, especially those members of LGBTQ that have 
we have looked at as other and not loved with the love of Christ. It was a powerful call. And it was an invitation to go right to this verse and to go, we're being called to love like Jesus loves. We're being called to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. You say, well, so what will pastor write? Look, it was so clear. And then one of the verses that he pointed to, but it was so clear, he says, look, isn't it the patience and the kindness of God that leads to repentance? When people come to your church, and they come to your church, and they, what, what do they experience? Are you open? Are you a welcoming church to invite any and all to come to this congregation? Is those doors open? Yes, our doors are open. And what is our posture? Our posture needs to be at the foot of the cross going, I am chief of sinners. I'm chief of sinners. That means no matter who comes to the door, whatever their reasons, and I'm going to believe that God is the one calling. But sometimes, maybe it's someone with mixed motives, whatever it is. We're on our knees saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Which means that the person who comes to the door is looking down at us. We're on our knees. We're not up here looking down at them. Amen? Our posture, the PVC posture, is that we're on our knees, and we are the ones saying, Behold, Lord, I want to do your will, and I want to be perfect in love as my Heavenly Father is perfect in love. This is going to be a God thing. It's going to be a God thing in each one of our lives that God would give us love for no matter whom it is that God brings into our circle and sphere of influence. We will love. And we'll love not in our own power, but we love because, what's Romans 5, 5 say? God pours his agape into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. God pours this into our hearts. It's his love that flows through you and me to bless others. And we pray that through patience and kindness of God, through us, that God will bring hearts to repentance that can never come with our judgmental stand. And so as the team comes and as we lift up our voices to sing, our call, God's call to us is a call to holiness. For by one sacrifice... He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Can I say it another way? Those who are being made to live just like Jesus. That's God's call on your life and on mine. Let's stand together. Lift our voices to this call, holiness.